Okay, so Henrik uh, was born between E.T. and Blade Runner. He's occasionally and breaking things. He's a computer scientist living in Berlin, and, and Henrik will indulge us today, in the next hour, why there is not a single problem that should be solved with blockchain, except maybe Bitcoin. So here I am, highly curious, so here we go. Henrik, over to you. Hi, my name is Henrik Plötz. I'm a computer scientist living in Berlin, and this is Blockchain 102. I have been doing things with cryptography for about 15 years now. I'm not a cryptographer per se, but mostly interested in communications protocols. I've been doing a lot of access control, RFID-related research. Um, as of late, I have my own company. We're doing payment stuff. Fair warning, I did have some Bitcoin in the early 2010s. Uh, I sold the last of it around 2016, I think. And since then, I've been more and more concerned with the basically the blockchain hype and how it uh, captures resources. And resources does not only refer to um, electrical power, but also engineering capacity, public attention, and, and mind space, basically. This talk is not going to be Bitcoin 101. I assume a basic knowledge of the Bitcoin and Ethereum networks, at least what they are and how they are used. I'm not going to introduce the basic concept of blockchains. What I will do is spotlight several interesting uh, projects and protocols in, in relation to that. I am going to play fast and loose with the definitions. I'm not going to stick to a very specific definition of what a blockchain is versus a hash chain. Anything basically related or in the vicinity of distributed ledger technologies is fair game. I hope by the end of this talk, you will have noticed that I'm not a big fan of anything I'm about to show you. And I do reserve the right to poke fun at any and all bad ideas. As a baseline, I think Bitcoin is a work of genius. It is a very elegant in its simplicity. Uh, the original paper by Satoshi Nakamoto in 2008 um, showing the first combination proof of work distributed ledger, uh, distributed ledger and hash chain um, solved the Byzantine agreement problem on a permissionless, uh, in a permissionless environment that is civil proof and only bas based on reasonable cryptographic assumptions. Like I said, it is elegant in its simplicity. It solves the problem for a very specific niche and um, there are at least three or four design decisions that are very integral and, and irreducible in the Bitcoin system. Taking any of them out will harm or break the entire system in obvious and or non-obvious ways, which of course is why people are going to do that. Um, Bitcoin itself has only very limited scripting in its transaction um, scheme. It's not designed to be a programming language. It's not designed for smart contracts, but the scripts are merely a very nice serialization format for authorization decisions um, so that you don't have to don't have to hard code into the network all the possible authorization schemes that are that should exist, should be able to exist, but any user of the network can um, build an, uh, a script that um, authorizes the spending of funds in any way they like. Bitcoin is a very elegant scheme and it's mostly useless. That's the point, that's, my, that's what I'm sticking with it. Sticking with, since um, the only purpose it can have is a global, decentralized, globally available um, currency, 
but it does have very, very low transaction throughput and uh, very high uh, energy usage at that. Ethereum came later. Um, it tried to improve by having a full-blown Turing complete smart contract language. Basically, Ethereum is a global computer that, as a side effect, also processes payment uh, transactions. First, we're going to look at so Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Ethereum, both proof of work. We're going to look at the different proof of something schemes. The easiest one, of course, is proof of authority. Um, works mostly like you would imagine it's going to work. You have the normal transactions, you have nodes that verify that transactions are correct. They put them into a block and sign the entire block uh, with their own uh, private key. And a sufficient quorum of authoritative nodes needs to sign a tr transaction block for it to become valid. It's very simple, very efficient and requires trust in those authorities. How they are chosen is completely out of scope and um, non-obvious. It is the, the, one of the standard constructions for private or permission blockchains. So those, that's why we say those are basically just glorified databases. Um, a slight step up is proof of stake. Proof of stake though is basically the same as proof of the authority, except that authority is now indirectly established by some sort of stake, such as token holdings. Uh, if you hold enough token of the underlying um, um, currency, you have more stake and therefore more authority. These systems may sometimes offer an integrated punishment mechanism called slashing, so that if you wield your authority in an inappropriate way, if you lie, you're, you're, you're penalized. Currently, proof of stake is the holy grail for um, the established proof-of-work systems to get rid of this energy waste stigma. Uh, for example, both Ethereum and IOTA, I'm going to talk about IOTA later on, um, currently are planning to pivot to a proof-of-stake based system any day now. Proof-of-stake has a very hard problem. How do you initially distribute the stake? It's that's why I said it's, it's essentially the same as with authority. You need to somehow select the authorities you trust. You need to select stakeholders you trust. And they then get to determine what happens on the network. A very popular mechanism to do that is sale of tokens, um, which is why I have this little red flag next to it. A sale of tokens or initial coin offering um, I'm going to invent a network, the very cool uh, cool chain. I'm going to sell $600 billion worth of cool chain tokens. And then you all are on my network and I'm $600 million richer. I don't care what happens to the network afterwards. An alternative to this is to bootstrap the proof of stake system off of an existing blockchain. For example, the Ethereum chain or Yotta is going to do that, I think, today. Which is, yeah, it doesn't have the same problem. Um, oh, no, it doesn't have the same benefit for the creators of the network. Uh, still, the problem with the general problem with proof of stake is that there is no built in defense against centralization. Bitcoin solves the centralization problem by sheer physics. Um, it's very, very hard to um, have more than 51% of the global computing power currently. But in a proof-of-stake system, there is no built-in defense against anyone uh, accumulating 51% of stake on their account or on any SOC pu puppet accounts. This is what I mean when I say there's no civil resistance, because on the internet nobody knows if you're a dog, and nobody knows um, who and how many you are or claim to be. A 
deeply ingrained problem is that even if you bootstrap the thing correctly, you have no defense against it becoming centralized later on by a stake being transferred and, and accumulated onto one big uh, stakeholder. The other POS is proof of storage. I'm not going to talk about that very much. There's uh, one very uh, well. Th there's one um, scheme that has gained notoriety because basically the introduction of the Chia network uh, crashed the global SSD market. So it was very very hard to buy any disks at that time. Also the operations on this network destroy SSDs in less than a year. So it's also it's really expensive to, to operate, even though it doesn't use electricity. It uses SSDs. And basically there's no other use. So I'm not going to talk about it later. The funniest proof system, and actually... Uh, um, the thing I came across that motiva motivated me to um, give this talk is proof of elapsed time, also called POET. The idea is uh, very simple and genius. Instead of computing hashes for proof of work, and proof of work in this case means uh, waiting some time, instead of uh, computing hashes, you just do nothing, you go to sleep. Compared to a proof-of-work system, this offers incredible energy savings. And it's a drop-in solution. It behaves exactly like a proof-of-work system in any, any, uh, any network. You can just swap out the proof-of-work system for a proof-of-elapsed time system. Mostly it makes sense in permissioned environments, private blockchains. I do have a small, uh, there, there is a very small question, a teeny tiny, teeny tiny issue. Which guarantees do other nodes have that um, no one cheats, no one is going to wake up earlier than assigned? Well, of course, uh, Intel SGX. It's the, uh, for those who, who don't know that, SGX is the uh, secure enclave uh, in Intel processors. Intel guarantees that. Um, Inside uh, this processor, secure computation can take place, and um, programs that run inside the enclave can prove that they are running in an uh, officially, um, officially official Intel secure enclave and are not being controlled by any, anybody else from the outside, and thus allow um, trusted execution. Small problem. Obviously, um, this isn't going to. This wasn't going to um, be secure forever. Uh, there was a very nice um, break of Intel SGX a year, two years ago. It went so far that they offer an attestation as a service. Service. There's, there's a Twitter account, and if you need anything signed by a real Intel SGX enclave, anything at all, any attestation to, to any any fact, you can just tweet it to this Twitter account, and um, they will happily sign it for you. And this is one of the underlying um, topics I want to draw your attention to, is that. Uh, some of these systems appear to be secure, but they're just shifting the security barrier somewhere else, and hope you don't look, um, and and hope you don't look too closely at at how and where the security is now. Um, for example, mobile coin is the other extreme. Basically, mobile coin has a proof. Uh, I would call it proof of complexity. Mobile coin is a mobile device focused new cryptocurrency started last year and it pulls every cryptographic register there is. They're using a stellar consensus network, they have zero knowledge proofs for everything, risk treasure abstractions, Schnorr anonymous signatures, Peterson commitments, you name it, they have it. I'm. Um, there's a very good book about, uh, about it. This uh, mechanics of mobile coin, 
uh, I have linked here. So even though I'm showing you this um, part of the abstract to scare you, I'm very grateful that it exists because not everyone has um, an abstract that so clearly states what they are doing and, and what they are hoping to achieve. Many of the documentation, a lot of the documentation that I've been reading for this talk um, doesn't clearly tell you what they are doing and why. Two small problems with uh, mobile coin: the entire token supply is pre-mined, which is one of the other red flags. 85% of the current uh, mobile coin uh, in existence and all the mobile coins that will ever be in existence are held by the creators of mobile coin. They can sell it to you at will. And their security against double spending. So they have security, they have privacy guarantees that probably, maybe, are good. It's, um, like I said, it's very complex and I wouldn't bet on there not being any implementation errors. But abs absent any implementation mistakes, their privacy guarantees and properties are probably good. But their security against double spending is entirely reliant on SGX enclaves. See previous slide. Circling back to Bitcoin and um, misusing Bitcoin, I introduced it as not having an entire full-blown um, scripting language, but you can still do cool stuff with it nevertheless. Uh, one of the earliest examples of that I saw was uh, due to Dan Kaminsky, who sadly passed away this year. In 2011, in his Black Ops of TCP IP talk, um, he uh, presented a tribute to Len Sesserman, who died that year, um, on the Bitcoin mainnet that is embedded in the Bitcoin blockchain. And th thus, uh, verifications of the entire blockchain is dependent on this tribute being present which is a very nice idea and I th I'm not sure but I think it was one of the first examples of this. A lot of people have embedded stuff into the blockchain later on and a very um, yeah, moving mem memorial to a friend. Another very cool hack uh, that is actually not being used as a hack anymore but is in production is the Lightning Network. Um, starting in 2016. I'm going to explain this in a little bit more detail, but not entirely in detail, since we have other content to get to. Um, what's interesting about the Lightning Network is that it works with Bitcoin more or less without changes. There were very small changes made to the Bitcoin mainnet, uh, but no fundamental changes. There's no new scripting language, only um, new instructions in the existing language. It's a clever use of time locks and multi-signatures. Uh, one of the features that most people aren't aware of is that not only can the Bitcoin scripting language allow you to put signature restrictions like possession of a pri private key, on spending of bitcoins, but you can also put a time lock on it and can say that a specific amount of bitcoin can only be spent after some time, basically time either in unix seconds or in, um, in block block height. Since the bitcoin network as a whole has a more or less predictable block uh, time of 10 minutes, you can rather reliably say that some some amount of money cannot be spent for 48 hours, for example. And that's the basic idea here. Two parties collaborate to open a so-called lightning channel or payment channel. Um, they need to fund this channel on the main chain. Um, like I'm putting the main chain here and the lightning channel or the, the entire lightning network at this point. So um, a properly functioning lightning channel only is visible in two transactions in the main network. There's the funding transaction, the one up here, 
that basically locks up some money in escrow, essentially, in escrow for the channel. And after that, um, the two parties exchange transactions amongst themselves. The main network does not need to know about these transactions. And they can send money back and forth. Uh, in this example, both start with, for example, two bitcoins. Both commit two bitcoins for this channel, so the channel has an entire capacity of four bitcoins. Each party starts off with two bitcoins at first, and then they can transfer or exchange transactions that transfer any arbitrary partial amount of that in either direction. So I'm starting with... Um, 0.2 bitcoins to B. Now the internal state is that B has a bit more money. Then I'm transferring in this example 1.5 in the other direction. Now B has less money and so on and so on and so on. Um, these actions, these transactions are very fast since they are just signature, two signatures and a TCP connection and therefore can happen instantaneously. At the end of uh, that channel, both parties can mutually agree to close the channel, and only the last state is written back onto the block, the main blockchain. The cool thing about this is that um, due to the clever use of time locks and multisix, um, all the amount of money in the channel is protected against uh, um, a cheating party. Um, these uh, in intermediate blocks need to be signed by both parties. So the, the end transaction is signed by both parties. But there is a Damocles sword, basically, um, hanging over this using the time locks, if any party cheats, the other party automatically gains the authority to claim the entire funds for themselves. This prevents the parties from cheating, because who wants to lose two bitcoins? But it also means that um, the maximum outstanding amount of money on this channel is limited to the escrow amount. This, in the channel, for example, in this example, at no point can any party owe the, the other more than four bitcoins. If you want to buy something really expensive, four bitcoins is a bit much, but if you want to buy something really expensive, um, you cannot use this channel, you need to close it and open another one. And that's the other big problem. The money that is held in escrow for this channel cannot be used for anything else. If you open a lightning channel to someone, that money is gone for the moment. And even worse, through the time lock mechanism, if the other party misbehaves, you cannot access the money for some time. 48 hours, for example. <laughs> so, it is a very cool hack, but I don't think it has any particular usefulness, especially since um, due to this... Um, uh, be because the outstanding amount cannot... Ex the outstanding money amount cannot exceed the entire capacity of the channel, it does not um, lend itself to being used, for example, for payments. It's okay if you have a friend and uh, you lend them like a bit of money today and they pay you back tomorrow. Day after that, you don't have any money with you and they lend you something and you pay them back. But uh, for a channel to exist over a long time, its um, mean amount needs to be zero. It oh, must be the same on both sides. Um, while most transactions and most systems are in a merchant and customer relationship. Uh, if I buy something, I pay money to the merchant and very seldomly do they pay me money. Um, this is the fundamental problem of the Lightning Network. 
they do have an extension. I've been um, um, drawing this uh, with uh, two participants. Lightning channels can be chained. So if A and B have a channel and B and C have a channel, um, there can be a value transaction between A and C mediated through B. But the problem that the um, outstanding amount on the channel cannot exist, exceed the funding amount doesn't go away. Back to something that was actually designed to be programmable, Ethereum. Very shortly after the introduction of Ethereum, um, there was the DAO. At that point, that was a singular noun, um, the Decentralized Autonomous Organization. Today, DAO is mostly used as a collective noun, basically a DAO, but at that point, it was the DAO. It was a cool idea. It's um, from the code of law, code is law people. Basically, you have a venture capital fund um, that anybody can contribute money to, either to. And anyone who has contributed money into the fund has voting rights and um, basically governance rights on, on the amount and can, can vote on where this money should be invested, proportional to the amount of money they invested. It had its own token at that point um, and was crowdfunded uh, end of June 2016 and sold at that time more than uh, for more than 150 million dollars this didn't last long there was a vulnerability in the so the dao has a function to split out sub daos if um, there's no consensus about what's supposed to happen so if the majority of the um, funders decide to do something that a minority disagrees with the minority can split out their money into a child DAO that then behaves like a normal DAO. And anyone can propose to create such a child DAO. The uh, code that processed that request had a, a bug, a classic time of check, time of use bug. Um, the smart contract first retrieved the ether um, to be sent to the child DAO from the main DAO and only then checked the balance of the uh, account that proposed the split. Uh, but at that point, a recursive call is possible. So you can nest um, this problem, uh, which means the transaction, uh, the nest transaction happens. So it uh, deducts money from the main, funds it into the child now, uh, recursive call, deduct money from main, fund into child, deduct money from main, and so on. And um, the check against the balance would only happen afterwards. Someone found this so, and, well, people say abused it, used it. Um, and by June 2016, like two weeks later, about 50 million US dollars worth of um, tokens were in the child DAO that was controlled, was supposed to be controlled, about to be controlled by one party. Luckily, or as luck would have it, there was a built-in uh, waiting period for proposals to go through and people to read their mails and stuff like that. That meant all the money that was in this child DAO couldn't be transferred out for at least 48 days, for exactly 48 days. So there was some discussion time as to what should happen now. This was the big discussion of that time because one party says uh, code is law. Someone used the code and obviously it's correct what they did because the code allowed, allowed that. Though the main Ethereum network did not quite see it that way, which led to a hard fork of the entire blockchain. That's why we have Ethereum and Ethereum Classic now. And I don't think anyone uses Ethereum Classic. Uh, like I said, the DAO had its own token, was one of the first. Um, there is now a generic mechanism to create your own tokens. It's the, basically an a API specification. 
if your contract fulfills the smart uh, this API, then you are an ERC20 token, and these tokens behave like money. Something you can transfer, um, you can query the balance. Those are the only relevant functions. Um, so if you put a contract onto the Ethereum blockchain that fulfills the specification, you have your own money. Lots of people do that. Um, there's more than 480,000 token contracts currently on the blockchain, on the Ethereum blockchain. And all the details of those tokens are up to the token creator, obviously. It's a smart contract that only has an interface and you can deposit and transfer money. Where this money comes from, or this amount value comes from, is not specified and entirely up to the token creator. These tokens can have their own value independent of the Ether, and some do. And that's how that works. What you can use this for is what I call crypto-enabled financial trickery. Since these tokens can basically only be traded, you can you have Dogecoin, and you, I if I would want Dogecoin, I could buy it from you, and then you would have some other amount of currency, some other kind of currency. And now we have over four hundred eighty thousand different kinds of currency to choose from. This um, enables exciting opportunities of arbitrage. If I find two marketplaces that sell um, token pairs at different prices, I can buy one token at the cheaper price and sell it at the more expensive price. That's the classic thing that you would also do, do on a normal stock exchange. The cool thing about Ethereum and uh, smart contracts is that um, the smart contracts are executed automatically and enforce automatically the contract stipulations, no matter what they look like. One of the really mind-blowing or very yeah, mind-opening things that they can, you can do with that is an uncollateralized flash loan. Basically, it's a smart contract that always has the following form. I give you some amount of money, you do whatever you want, and then you return the money with some fee, plus some fee. Um, you are completely free what, to do whatever you want in this step. You can, like, like I said, exploit arbitrage opportunities. You can sell something at a, at a different marketplace and then buy back. The uh, important thing is that you pay me back plus interest. And the cool thing about uh, the Ethereum or the, the, the smart contract language is that this is guaranteed to happen atomically. Um, either the entire thing happens or nothing happens at all except for some gas spending. If um, you cannot return the amount, for example, because your cool um, arbitrage uh, trick didn't work out, it's reverted and never happened. Um, so I can enforce for you to pay me some money and you can, so that's for me, good for me, good for me is I can enforce you to pay me some interest and good for you, you have a lot of money. Like I said, it's very good for exploiting arbitrage opportunities. And it's also very good for exploiting smart contract vulnerabilities because a lot of these need some funding. And if you have a vulnerability that doubles your input, for example, it's very cool if you can lend, if you can borrow a hundred million dollars for like $10,000 in, in interest and then double it. And finally, decentralized finance, DeFi, De DeFi, DeFi, decentralized finance, DeFi, um, is just the uh, umbrella and marketing term for everything we just uh, talked about. Uh, it allows most uh, operations that you can do uh, with traditional financial instruments, but on the blockchain. 
borrowing lending, flash borrowing, high frequency trading, price speculation, and swapping between token pairs. Like swapping Dogecoin for what's one of the other coins? Dogecoin Doge for Tether or Back, something like that. Now, this is one of the subjects I'm most often laughing about because, as you can see on this slide, there's a huge, a huge amount of money in here. There's a <clears throat> hell lot of money bound in DeFi de contracts, but the complexity um, means that very often, well, code is law, but the law did, does not always say what you thought it is. Uh, by my estimation, and when I when I search for that, I've, I found this website, which very graciously already has an entire list. I didn't need to compile it. By my estimation, about approximately every other week, someone exploits a bug in one of the DeFi systems to the tune of 10 to 100 million US dollars. These are just from like the last two months. Now for something completely different, the IOTA network. IOTA is um, not a blockchain. So, like I said, I didn't, don't want to dwell on the, the terms, uh, but they call themselves a tangle. It's a directed as acyclic graph. It's not a chain, um, but every every transaction is supposed to confirm to other transactions. It doesn't have any proof of work, so it's very fast and uh, energy efficient. It doesn't use a lot of energy. I'm not sure if it's efficient if it doesn't do anything, but it doesn't use a lot of energy. Uh, it doesn't have any proof of work. It doesn't have any proof of anything, really. It doesn't have any transaction fees. You just are required to trans uh, verify two other transactions. Uh, it's designed or marketed for Internet of Things, things networks. It's actually run by a foundation uh, with um, located here in Berlin. <laughs> and the, uh, the thing that sets it apart from... Um, one of the things that sets it apart from all of the other established players is that it's not a decentralized system. Their consensus protocol is that they have a central coordinator that has to uh, sign off on every transaction. If the coordinator didn't verify it, uh, it didn't happen. There were several attacks on the IOTA system in the past, and uh, the foundation could... Uh, uh, luckily could stop the attacks by basically just stopping the coordinator. Like I said, the coordinator is just one of the things uh, that makes this one unique. The other <laughs> unique thing about IOTA is that they want to be unique. They have their own, or they had, they had their own home world cryptography. One of the rules is never rule your own cryptography. And not only did they build their own cryptography, they did it in trinary. So in their system there isn't just 0 or 1, but they have minus 1, 0 or 1. Everything is a twit. And of course their uh, custom built uh, trinary hash function was broken. In 2019, the the IOTA Foundation did not react favorably to this. Um, they tr uh, it's um, the second link on this page uh, has some of the history or some of the meta history. Basically, uh, there were, were very interesting Twitter discussions and uh, threats against the researchers, threats of legal action, including the IOTA Foundation claiming that, or the creators, I'm not sure of the foundation itself, the creators claiming that they knew about the vulnerability and it was there on purpose to act as a sort of copy protection. Uh, their defense is that if anybody would um, 
copy the IOTA protocol, since everything is open source, and build a clone IOTA network, they could then use this vulnerability to shut down the other network. Which is a bit of bullshit. Um, in the aftermath, they removed the broken hash function and replaced it with one that's based on Kekak, the um, um, SHA-3 hash function, but still in trinary and it's still broken. Nobody cares. It's still broken. Nobody cares. Okay, let's move on in our alphabet soup. SSI. It's not server-side include this time. SSI is supposed to stand for self-sovereign identities, and Wikipedia defines this as an approach to digital identity that gives individuals control of their digital identities. And no one knows what that means. There's no single standard, nor specification, or shared understanding of what this might be. Um, the graphic uh, I put here is one that's most often used to explain how this is supposed to work. Um, it's indistinguishable from a uh, standard PKI attribute certificate issuance. Like you have an issuer that issues a certificate that's stored in a wallet and can then pre present it to a verifier. For some reason, some, some reason that nobody has been able to uh, explain to me to my satisfaction, it's also stored in the blockchain. What um, this diagram lacks, and what most of these systems tend to lack, is a very crucial um, additional arrow. It's very good if um, I have the cryptographic proof that uh, some credential was really issued by a certain issuer, but I still need to get trust in that issuer from somewhere. I, I still need to know that they are who they claim they are. And this is something that's basically entirely ignored in all of the self sovereign identity uh, schemes I've seen and coming up on. Uh, key terms. There's this uh, thing called a decentralized identifier, DID, which is supposed to be the, the, the abstraction. Uh, there's a W3C standard on that, and the registry currently lists 114 mutually incompatible DID methods. Like I said, it behaves like an attribute certificates. Uh, this is called a verifiable dis credential. And one of the only new things, uh, or one of the things that established protocols don't have, it's not new, is that they should support selective disclosure. Selective disclosure means if I get a credential uh, to multiple facts, like my name is Henrik, my last name is Plötz, I'm living in Berlin, I can then present this credential but block out some of the fields and just prove, for example, that I'm living in Berlin. If I want something from the Berlin authorities, they might not need to know who I am, just that I can prove that I live in Berlin. It's one of the key features, for example, of the U-Proof system, um, due to Stefan Brandt's in 2000, I think, uh, which um, was built into Microsoft um, Cardspace, I think, and for some reason completely vanished off the face of the earth. Nobody ever he heard of it again, but it did solve all of this in 2000 already. Um, nevertheless, all these uh, self sovereign identity people are very eager to show you their um, their use cases and their uh, show showcases. For example, this one um, presenting information to an employer. In the future, you will have your diploma or your master's your master's degree as a verifiable credential that you can then attach to your uh, CV when applying for a new job and your employer will be able to verify that and doesn't need to trust 
that you didn't change your grades. Um, like I said, very small, insignificant issue. I s the, the, the employer still somehow needs to trust the issuer. I can go on the blockchain and open the uh, very cool University of Coolness and issue master's degrees in coolnessness um, and give everyone A grades. And I can prove that I really am the uh, cool University of Coolness. But somehow the verifier, the potential employer, still needs to know whether I am an officially accredited university whose master's degree is worth anything. And at that point you have a very standard PKI structure. You, you have a central authority, like a list of good universities. And from there on you can delegate the trust down and you don't need and don't need any of the decentralized stuff. And in either case you don't need any of the blockchain stuff. I have never understood why. No, I, that's not right, all right. I made this point on Twitter once and someone actually emailed me. I, I'm, I'm not sure, either ID Union or Lissy. Um, someone emailed me and said that um, they kind of know that they don't need it, but uh, the problem they are solving is that there are so many interested parties in the space, so many companies who want to promote their own wallet product that there's no way that they can decide on a governance structure, on, on a PKI structure, on who um, trusts whom and um, who delegates trust to where. So instead, they are putting it all onto the blockchain and thereby um, completely erasing the trace of where the trust chain comes from and hope their uh, respective companies don't notice. So basically, it's, it's money laundering for PKI is what they're using the blockchain for. A related standard in this space is DID.com. It's um, uh, from the Identity Foundation, very cool domain name, if I may say so. Yeah. It's a long standards document. It's a really long standards document. It has everything. It has JSON web messages, JSON web token, uh, it has a custom asynchronous request reply messaging scheme with multiple parallel asynchronous threads of communication. It has a routing layer, transport layer, discovery, there's everything in there except provisions for recipient verification. So I can have my uh, uh, decentralized identify my verifiable credential. I could present my verifiable credential to someone selectively so that they only get to know what I want them to know, except I have no idea who they are. Which brings us to uh, this year's news, the ID wallet. Uh, exactly in the last week before this year's German um, parliamentary elections, our esteemed government released an app, or one of the intermediaries, released an app to a big um, PR fund for called ID wallet, or released the um, use cases for that, which was supposed to be a self-sovereign identity system based on DRD.com um, that could in the future be used for a lot of other things. We're completely ignoring, we're completely ignoring at this point that Germany already has an EID system that works, uh, but it's not cool, it's not blockchain, it's not hip. So this um, ID wallet app you can use it to create a self-sovereign identity called Basis ID. And this self-sovereign identity is created by having the Bundesdruckerei sign a data set that they extracted from your national ID card. So the self-sovereign identity is created by the Bundesdruckerei essentially. And you can then use this identity to query the uh, Federal Transport Motor Transport Authority for a copy of your driver's license that then is assigned to this um, um, that is then assigned to this um, verifiable credential. Nothing you couldn't just do with you know a database a signature but um, it is a blockchain system and it didn't end well. A few days after public release the entire thing was stopped. 
The official reason given is that there was too much interest, uh, too, too much load due to unanticipated high interest in the system. What um, you will find on Twitter, if you um, looking into um, Lilith Wittmann and Flipke, who were the main um, actors in this space, is that the entire thing was run on very badly maintained infrastructure. There were DNS stone transfers, there were open subdomains, uh, anything you, you... A lot of things not good. And uh, the coup de grace is that um, Lilith um, showed the privacy problem mentioned earlier, that even though I can very present present my verifiable credential to someone in a secure way, I have no idea who I'm, whom I'm presenting it to. And that's inherent in the protocol. There's no way to fix it and no plans to fix it. So the thing uh, remains shut down for the time being and probably for good. Hopefully. On the subject of silliness, NFT. NFT stands for non-fungible token. Um, so for comparison, the tokens I talked about before, the ERC20 tokens, are fungible. Yeah. Every token is the same. Every to you, you can replace every token with any other. In Bitcoin, even there, there is no stable token. Every time you spend Bitcoin, your existing Bitcoin gets destroyed and a new Bitcoin is created. ERC20 tokens don't really need to exist in any... Uh, exact meaning of the phrase, um, <clears throat> but still, it's it's just the value. There there is no countable token, and not only no countable, there's no unique token. Uh, the other standard, the newer one, ERC seven twenty one, specifies the API for non fungible tokens. What it essentially does is track every token individually. The token gets a token identifier. Token gets a token identifier. And the uh, blockchain records who is the current, the identifier of the current owner of the token. And what the smart contract then allows is um, transferring the token from owner to owner. Normally, it doesn't store any other information other than um, who the current owner is. Um, but so, so this emulates basically a collectible. A token can be created on the blockchain and then sold and resold. But now you might be asking, where do these JPEGs come in from, of which I've heard so much. What you can do in the token standard is associate metadata with the token. Actually, you can't. You can associate an URL with the token that can point to metadata. And this metadata might then optionally point to an asset file. Could be video, could be 3D model, anything, or some other metadata, like the name of the token. There's something I'm not going to talk about. That's called the interplanetary file system. It's a decentralized storage system that actually behaves mostly as you would like it to. Most crucially, uh, if, if you point to um, an IPFS address, it's immutable. But that's not the standard, uh, wasn't the standard for a long time. For a long time, all the metadata and the data was just stored on the server of whoever minted the token or of the platform that the token was minted on. And um, Moxie made this very cool demonstration where you can look at the same, the identical, non-fungible token on different platforms and it would display differently because the metadata points to a URL that can behave differently depending on um, where you come from. So what are NFTs good for? Basically, scams. Um, one of the problems is that there's no verification requirement, no relationship to any real-world identity. Anyone can mint any asset into an NFT and sell it. They don't need proof of ownership. Um, and if you believe that, I have a very nice bridge to sell you. The Different uh, platforms where you can create and sell NFTs. Um, 
mostly are tired of the problem now and are very much much slower to respond to complaints now there are entire so so there are obvious apparently there are people out there who just go through for example deviant art take every image from there um, make an nft out of it and try to sell it it's like if you go on twitter and say i need that on a t-shirt there will be a bot that offers to sell you that t-shirt even though it probably doesn't have the um, copyright on whatever you responded to. A uh, very cool thing someone found on Twitter the other day is that, um, related to the previous slide, if um, uh, a lot of these platforms actually store the data, the NFT data, just on Google Cloud services, and Google's uh, takedown processes are still working. So you can remove the NFT content without um, cooperation from the NFT platforms. Another problem, it's a very complex, the entire thing. This leads to many, so even if there are no um, engineering or security vulnerabilities in there, this leads to a lot of successful social engineering attacks with the added benefit that any token that has been stolen now rightfully, code is law, belongs to the no owner. There was this very um, famous case a uh, few months ago of the Bored Apes. Very high profile case. Um, someone uh, got scammed out of three apes, I think. Value like two million dollars. Um, they successfully petitioned the trading platforms to stop halt trading on these tokens, which doesn't bode well for the decentralized nature of this thing, but that's that. To me, it's funny. To um, the people affected, it's not. Uh, since you have no verification that an actual person is on the other side, or who is on the other side, um, there's this phenomenon called um, rug pull. Basically, you start a new project, you uh, announce uh, borrowed apes were yesterday's news. We are now doing evolved apes. They are better, they are better in every way, they can be used in games. Uh, please buy them here, enter money here. And after you've received all the money, you just clean out the accounts and vanish. This is what happens couple of times now. I don't have uh, all the examples on here. Sometimes it happens even in teams. There are a couple of posts of people actually trying to start a project uh, and then complaining that the administrator they um, uh, they task they tasked with keeping safekeeping of the secret keys just went and took all their money and is gone now. In conclusion There's really not a lot of uses for any of this, except for Ponzi schemes and tricking people. Especially, it's all self-referential. You can do financial instruments just fine, everything works great. It's not the um, energy, uh, most energy conserving way to do that, but uh, it can give good return on invest. Of course, you always need to keep in mind that if you earn money, Someone else lost it. So you can do uh, the crypto-enabled financial trickery just fine. But the core problem of any and all blockchain projects is the Oracle problem. All the cryptographic stuff, all the verification, zero knowledge proofs, what have you, only works within the system. You cannot interface into the real world in any meaningful way. Um, because if you need, did, uh, if you wanted to, you would need a node that acts as a mediator between the blockchain world and the physical world. You need to trust that node to, for example, accurately report sensor data or to accurately um, um, uh, execute some actions. And if you can trust that node to do that, you can also trust the node to, to do that without a blockchain. Uh, like one of the, the funniest projects I've heard was for trash collection. Fairness in trash collection, there's a sensor in every trash bin 
and trash collectors like munis municipal waste and every trash collector um, gets money for the trash they collected based on the sensor readings but the sensor nodes of course um, can't be part of any blockchain no energy no nothing no no connectivity so they just report all their readings to a central server and that central server then records uh, all the data on the blockchain and at that point the central server could just disperse the uh, amount uh, due for trash collecting there's no need to direct the blockchain into anything here put into one sentence cryptocurrencies have more or less by definition only one use case and that's ponzi schemes and other scams there can be i have said that before there can be uh, some benefit to having a pure timestamping service so the blockchain combines um, timestamping and consensus if you don't need the consensus because anything you do is centralized by nature anyway there can be some upside to using um, a Merkle tree or a timestamping chain uh, without any of the um, without any of the uh, blockchain overhead consensus overhead so this is the end of this talk i will be available for your questions now okay yeah vielen dank henrik uh, for this talk uh, I, sorry wrong language uh, so thank you very much henrik for this talk um and uh, i i found it a really uh a Good, actually, as an overview of, of what is out there. Um, okay, so we have questions, um, and I'll uh, 20 minutes for questions. I see we have roughly 14, 15 questions by now, so it should be okay. Go through them one by one. So first question, here it goes. Why do you think Bitcoin is wasting a lot of energy be used for mining depends on the difficulty the difficulty is lower, then Bitcoin will become more energy efficient. So the real problem is just that the Bitcoin price is used as a speculative asset. Um, the energy consumption can never get lower, except if the price collapses. Um, only if the price is below the cost of energy will the energy consumption fall. Otherwise, you, you do have, obviously, there is this hashing capacity in the world. There are people, there are groups of people who do have both the hardware and the energy supply to mine. So if everybody else mines less, they have an incentive to mine more, A, in order to get more rewards, and B, at some point, the rewards shift. If, if you have a group that is large enough to um, have 51% of the hashing capacity of the world, they can gen th then just do double spending on the blockchain. They can gen then do uh, scams outright. So there is the incentive is to have uh, the, the incentives mean that the uh, hashing capacity needs to increase or stay the same, except if the energy price is too low, uh, too, too high. At that point, the um, hash rate is capped by the energy supply, and at some point, it becomes profitable to just do the double spending attack, and everything collapses entirely. Thank you. Second question. Since man invented currency, it has always been based on trust, whether in gold, real estate, or the economic strength of a nation. It has been known even longer that greed eats the minds, which why it is deadly. However, neither of these is an argument for me to demonize the entire blockchain technology. In your opinion, how would a blockchain in the context of a digital currency have to be implemented? Uh. What's the ideal implementation of, of a blockchain currency? There isn't one. Um, like I said, so proof of work only burns rainforests for very little gain. Proof of stake is 
um, just a different form of authority. It's just a different thing you're trusting in uh, with no physical and no cryptographic guarantees of anything uh, that you would want to guarantee. Um, if you have currency, you need to have trust, basically. And at that point, you can formalize the trust, uh, like we're currently trusting the euro to be something worth because the European Union is worth something. Thanks. Would you also take a look at proof of burn consensus? It is described as a POW without energy waste. Miners can burn coins to get the right to produce blocks. Proof of work. No, I haven't I haven't seen that. It doesn't sound like proof of work. It's like a form of proof of stake, basically. The way I understood it now. So proof, it, it, here it's called proof of burn consensus. And it, mm -hmm. it says that it's described as proof of work. Without it. All yeah, right. but you, you uh, already need to get the things you burn from somewhere. And at that point, it's just turtles all the way down. All right. Uh, regarding lightning channel, how does the, the Damocles sword that you mentioned and previous cheating work roughly? Uh, I suppose technically from a okay. So there's two time locks involved, and um, basically uh, I showed this exchange between the two parties, mm -hmm. and in order for them to send me their signature under the new state. I first have to send them a signature that guarantees them the money in 48 hours. So I enable them to completely clean out the account in 48 hours. And only then will they send me the thing I asked for. And the other thing has a time lock of 24 hours. So if either, if the party that, uh, I'm not sure about the order, but um, the first party that misbehaves, um, needs to broadcast basically needs to broadcast their misbehavior on the blockchain for it to be um, um, so they need to broadcast the uh, transaction they want to execute at which point I have a certain time amount 24 hours or 48 hours to broadcast my um, transaction that they gave me beforehand basically as a um, um, as a proof um, yeah as, as, as a ticking time bomb or no, it's a counter um, okay. counter escrow. So they need to misbehave on the blockchain publicly visi visibly visible. In which case, I can transmit my um, uh, it's it's like an, an um, hostage. In which case, I can transmit the thing I have they gave me to entirely counter the thing. So it's basically implemented uh, by integrating the blockchain at this point. Uh steps out of the, the lightning channel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, why do you think that proof of space and time has no use cases for from what um, the person that asked that question reads? It solves a lot of problems. Uh, BTC has, so Bitcoin. Um, and the Nakama, Nakamoto consensus is completely reinvented. It is very decentralized, has a minimal hardware requirement. The pool protocol is very robust. It is auditable because it uses variant of Lisp and solves a lot of attacks that are possible on block, a lot of blockchains. So one of the things... Uh, one of the hints you might get is that nobody uses it. If it would, if something is is a good solution, it's likely someone is using it. Uh, that's the uh, che uh, um, cheeky uh, answer. The other is that it isn't as um, environmentally conscious, for example, as their proponents make it out to be, because it destroys SSDs, and that's also a lot of energy waste, and then uh, hazardous electros electronic waste. Um, so yeah, that's that's basically that. I think IPFS. If you want to have distributed storage, IPFS is a way to go, probably. Uh, and it still needs, though, though it still needs someone to operate it. That's the problem. That's true. 
Um, did you explore the use of LN for messaging payment information instead of just sending value as a content type for within a payment service? Alan, A L N N. I uh, hear it's written capital L, capital N. I'm not sure either what it stands for. Uh, it's the Lightning Network. And All what right. was the question? So, did you explore the use of Lightning Network for messaging, messaging payment information instead of just sending value as content type for for within a payment service? So no, instead of. I did not. Yeah. I don't think I know what messaging on LN would be. Okay, fair enough. Uh, did you consider the concept of atomic cross shard compatibility? What Radix solved with Cassandra? No, um, I, I, I only have a vague idea of what you're uh, saying, but um, no. Yeah, this is the, unfortunately, we can't ask back. Mm -hmm. I also have the text I read to you. So uh, if the person maybe can can quickly submit um, a, a clarification, then we can, can cover that. Uh, could you elaborate on issues with blockchain re? Uh, so yeah, here it's blockchain and then small r e. Uh, so with it, with, uh, can you? Could you elaborate on issues with blockchain re or a uh, physical or digital asset tracking, i.e.g. Oh, yeah. in, ter in terms of real decentralization or the con or consequences of no real decentralization? Thanks. So, yeah, that's what I said. That's basically the Oracle problem in a different form. You need someone to enter the asset information into the blockchain, at which point you have someone that you trust to correctly enter that. Um, I wanted to look this example up. Unfortunately, I didn't find it again. I, I saw that on Twitter where someone um, described their um, blockchain experience um, where someone built an, an asset management system and it was entirely great inventory management and uh, we buy blue widgets and red widgets and it entirely tracks them from source to or from origin to destination. And then they asked, so what happens if we buy 10 black widgets and someone enters, the, we bought 10 red widgets? At which point the other side fell completely silent. Um, so it's just a different form of the Oracle problem. And, and also the actor problem. For example, Germany has uh, the, the current German federal government has a blockchain strategy where they want to investigate having the Grundbuch, the um, um, yeah. um, um, uh, register of uh, which area belongs to whom on the blockchain, which begs the question why? Because um, there are not that many um, uh, things that a state naturally has to do. But providing for the security of, of um, real estate is uh, certainly one of them. Uh, since um, if there's a transaction on the blockchain, or the blockchain says this plot of land belongs to me, who am I going to call to enforce that? The blockchain, please? And th that's the same. That's asset tracking. That's inventory management. At which point I ha already have a centralized trusted authority. Um. Next question. Did you consider the concept? We had that. Uh, could you elaborate on? Uh, sorry, we had that too. Uh, er my apologies. Er everything you describe has been used for decades in finance, from short selling to the most complex derivatives. Why should digital currencies be any different? In the stock market, it has been always true. Everything that de everything depends on whether there's more fools than papers or more papers than fools. Sure, sure. I'm I'm not against <laughs> entirely not arguing against using well. Certainly, um, traditional financial instruments are not better than blockchain financial instruments or vice versa. It's just that the blockchain ones also have the energy usage of usage of Sweden for the equivalent of four transactions per second. Um, that's basically a small town 
it's not the New York Stock Exchange. The New York Stock Exchange has a much, 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 much lower energy footprint than the blockchains, the different blockchains, and a much, 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 much higher transaction throughput. Okay, so we have now uh, 12 questions left, and I believe we have something like five minutes. So, we... okay, okay, perfect. So I, I just, I just heard that we have 10 more minutes. So that's awesome. Thank you. Um, so how does ION by Microsoft fit the stated description of SSI? Yeah, I haven't looked into ION. I know of it. And I actually didn't find that much information. Um, so I cannot quite answer that. Okay. It, it's Bitcoin, it's uh, the, the same problem as everyone. So these SSI things tend to ignore the, the main problem is trusting the source. The main problem is not writing or the, the, the um, Cryptographic credentials or verification signatures, certificates. I don't think Ion does anything particularly good. Fair enough. Uh, why does SSI need blockchain? Is, yeah, I don't know. Is it like a PGP key server, but with but with blockchain? Like I said, so it doesn't. It's just cool and integrated, and it blurs the technological lines. You don't actually know how it works anymore. The complicated thing is trusting or getting a trust chain to the issue. And the way I understood it is proponents believe they, they put this trust ch chain into the blockchain. or Basically, if it's on the blockchain, it's trusted. But the blockchain doesn't add anything, except maybe for timestamps. But you can have timestamps much more cheaply. Um, your main point is that blockchain crypto is only useful for proof to prove scarcity and is therefore only useful as money, nothing else. But I guess this was the point of, uh, block, uh, of Bitcoin in the first place. The whole scam started later then. Yeah, you can. So it's absolutely the same scam as everything, every, every scammer before them, like selling valuable stocks, penny stocks like that. Um, my point is that there, uh, blockchain technology, so there is no use for blockchain technology, except maybe exactly this very small niche for global, globally decentralized, civil proof um, currency with no prior trust in the um, participants though it comes at a very high energy cost. And removing any of these words from the sentence completely collapses the, the rationale for that. And you don't need any blockchain proof of work anymore. Okay, uh, thanks. How, how could one benefit from irrationally the market? Sorry, that it... Sorry you're dropping out. Uh, how how could one benefit irrationally of the market F NFTs silly coins without fail, falling prey to it? Sure, if I, I understand have, the question. Yeah, yeah. I've, so the yeah the question is how to profit of NFTs without you know being the prey. I think it's a first mover thing. Um, you win if you are the first. And you need to keep very, very good care of your digital security, um, OPSEC, in order to not lose anything. Even then, it's a basic, basic pyramid scheme scam. Okay. Uh, so the, the short answer is, if you can be successful if you already are a successful scammer. And then you know what to do. Okay. How much energy do payment systems you use overall consume? Please also count it. Uh, it count in the dependencies. Yes. Um, I had this number once. I don't have it anymore. Uh, let's. 
Yeah, I don't have it anymore. The um, calculation was like the entire global financial system, including all banks, uh, computers, secretaries, cleaning crews, consumes order of magnitude, like a tenth, maybe a quarter of the Bitcoin network. But that includes all banks. Uh, I'm I'm not sure about the exact number, but it was less. It was not that much less. It was like half or quarter. Uh, but it includes all banks. All banks yeah. and all support staff, all the vacuums that clean the hallways and stuff like that. That's that's insightful. Thanks. Are you aware of OpenTimestamps.org, a service yes. that lets? All right. Um, so, great proof of existence for law purposes. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, my issue with open timestamps is that they still depend on the blockchain, or the Bitcoin blockchain, or Ethereum blockchain. Um, my point is that the blockchain, the one thing you need, one of the things you might need a blockchain for, is to find a consensus. For proof of existence, you don't need a consensus. Proof of existence works because the thing itself, so that, that, that's, that is it. So the thing is um, actionable in itself. If you publish something onto a Merkle tree, like certificate transparency, this publication is effective in itself. You don't need a consensus whether this publication happened, because obviously it happened because it's on there, or it didn't if it's not on there. Um, you don't need any um, blockchain consensus for that. The only thing you need a blockchain, or the, the only thing they use it for is because they are afraid of their own courage uh, in order to tether their system to an existing system. But this doesn't need to be a block. It actually was a company or several companies that did something similar by just pub using a standard Merkle tree and publishing the current uh, hash of the tree, the, the current head, into the New York Times, the newspaper of record. And then there's like a 100,000 copies of uh, that day's hash. It's very hard to modify afterwards and gives you proof of existence without wasting any energy. Yeah, uh, questions come pour, pouring in actually. So I don't think that we'll be able to all cover them. Uh, would it be okay for people to contact you? Um, sure. Do we have uh, uh, afterwards, like, I don't know, co video conference stuff or whatever? I'm, I'm not sure. Or contact me directly. I think it would be easiest if, if people could contact you directly. Mm -hmm. um, I think. You you had it on your last slide. Maybe you could mm -hmm. repeat how people could reach out to you. Yeah, I have uh, I have an email address, a Threema URL, and uh, Twitter Henrik Plötz. H e n r y k p l o e t z. Cool. Thank you. Um, yeah. So maybe one one short question. Stop. Is there any use for the blockchain then? It seems that there's no point of it at all. Exactly. So there's use. It's scams. Uh, if you don't think that's a legitimate use, there probably isn't. I'm fully in support of at least, uh, if not banning it, for example, for public projects. There, there's uh, really no reason why our government should spend any money on that. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much, um, Henrik, for, for this talk, for the for your for all your patience and, and questions that you answered. I think it was great. I think the, the um, amount of questions also shows some interest. Um, so my pleasure.